I'm Ray Shelley. Um, I am from Leaf Labs. We're uh, embedded services, uh, like research and embedded engineering firm here in Cambridge. Uh, we do everything from digital design to embedded systems to PCBs. And today I'm going to be talking about my journey and learning about wave pipelines, specifically building wave pipelines and FPGAs. So what is a wave pipeline? Essentially, it's a block of combination logic, and what we're going to do is we're going to input data into it before the previous input has reached the output of the combination logic block. So what we're going to have is at least two or multiple waves of computation traveling through our combination logic, uh, and we're essentially going to be using the combination logic delay as virtual storage elements in place of registers. Um, this was originally published, I guess, by L. Cotton in 1969, who called it maximum rate pipelining. And he basically observed that the rate that you can put logic through a circuit isn't dependent on the crit path, but the difference between the crit path and the minimum path. So I put this timing diagram in here just to help everyone visualize what this is, if this is a new concept to you. So you can see at the rising edge of the input clock, clock hits the launch flip-flop, there's some clock to queue time, and right at that output, all the data is in phase. Uh, it hasn't gone through any logic yet, so hopefully everything's lined up. And this y-axis is the combination logic we're putting our data into. As it travels through the circuit, there are gonna be paths that are shorter and paths that are longer. So you can see that there's some fan out. Uh, the bottom line is the data that's taking longer, the longer combinational paths, and the top line is the shorter ones. So when we're thinking about sampling this, we want to sample in a stable region where uh, data isn't switching, basically. Um, and you'll notice the second rising edge on the input clock launches data in while I is only halfway through the circuit. So I plus one enters while I is halfway through, and then I is eventually captured two clock cycles later on the output. Um, there's two types of wave pipelines, generally speaking. There's self-synchronous self-synchronous wave pipelines where you do no clock skew, um, and those are only going to work at certain frequency ranges, and then there are skewed wave pipelines where you skew the clock to line it up in one of these stable regions. Uh, so why is this interesting? Um, digital design is fun. We love FPGAs. We love working with FPGAs. Um, this feels like it shouldn't be possible, and that's what kind of makes it fun and silly. Um, Tooling is not made for doing this. That also makes it exciting. Um, Vivado really doesn't want to make wave pipelines. Um, because of this, I've become much more familiar with my EDA tooling, trying to coax Vivado into doing this. Um, I love studying FPGA architecture. This is a great excuse to do that, because you have to do manual placement and routing. You get to do some cool timing analysis, and hopefully you gain a deeper understanding of digital design through doing something kind of wacky and unconventional. Uh, so let's talk about classical pipelining for a second. Well, how do you get the latency of your pipeline? Well, that's easy. It's just the number of stages times the clock period. Well, how do we define clock period? Well, clock period is the clock to queue time plus the maximum delay plus setup, and we're going to ignore clock skew for now. Uh, so what is latency knowing that? Well, it's the number of register stages times clock to queue plus the max path plus the setup time constraint. So the takeaway here is each register has an overhead in your pipeline and it's the clock to queue and setup time constraint. So every time you add a register to your pipeline, you're increasing the latency just to like have a register, not to do any computation with your combination logic. Um, and then classical pipelining, because of this, yields diminishing returns. The more you cut your max path, the more it's dominated by just this constraint that we have from using registers. Wave pipelines don't need registers. Now we don't have this register overhead, and we can have a low latency pipeline that doesn't suffer from this clock to queue and setup time constraint. Uh, and for reasons that I'll explain on the next slide, we're no longer, the max frequency is no longer set by the crit path. So what is it set by? Well, as I said before, it's set by the difference between the max and min paths. Uh, 
Um, so this first equation is like the very generic one you'll see in papers. I rearranged it to make more sense to me and bolded it. Hopefully, maybe it makes more sense to you like that. Um, and basically what we want to do is minimize skew or equalize the delay pass of our combination logic. Uh, so just like normal flip-flop stuff, you want the data to be stable for a window around the rising clock edge, and that window is set by your setup time and your hold time. Um, if we have all of our delay pass equalized, then it's gonna, what it's gonna look like at the output is this first picture, where we drove our, we drove the inputs to the circuit for one clock period, and because there was no skew, they arrive at the output for one clock period, and that's a big capture window. If we introduce skew to the system, then now we're lowering our capture window because the maximum delay is gonna arrive later, the minimum delay is gonna arrive first, and everything else in between. So existing research on this, I initially stumbled across this uh, reading one of my favorite BLSI textbooks. Uh, it has a bunch of fun tricks in it and things like this. Um, and then I immediately Googled, can you do this in an FPGA? Uh, I found a bunch of papers just explaining the concept and talking about it like in an ASIC context, but I was able to find one paper from 1998 that talks about doing this in a very old Dialynx FPGA, which I was very excited about. Um, so of course I wanted to try and have my own wave pipeline. So basically the rest of this talk is going to be me trying to build a wave pipeline based off of this paper I found. So they used an old FPGA. Um, they made a wave pipeline cellular guild array multiplier, a circuit I have never heard of. Um, and they were able to achieve 13 stages, which means that um, there were 13 unique waves of computation going through the same logic block at one time. And they were able to run that at 84 megahertz. So to re-implement this, I first needed to figure out what's the cellular guild array multiplier. They referenced another paper from 1969 describing the circuit. I couldn't find that, but I did find one from 87. Um, and using that, I was able to figure out how it's supposed to work and implement that. Basically, the idea without having to think about it too hard, is each cell computes a partial product and then sums the previous partial product and propagates that. And that happens along this diagonal. Uh, and then the carries are propagated along the other diagonal. Um, and of course, at the top, you have your inputs and the outputs come out at the bottom. And you can see how this circuit might be a good place to start if your goal is to equalize delay paths. It sort of lends itself somewhat to that. Uh, so now I need to figure out how to map this to my FPGA. Um, so I've got four outputs I need to generate for each cell. Uh, and lucky me, a seven series LUT or slice has four LUTs inside of it. Um, so I use one slice to pack in one of my cells in my guild array multiplier. Um, so I basically use primitives to manually instantiate the logic I want for the partial product and the carry out. Uh, and then I also need to buffer the X term and the Y term so that it stays in phase with all my other data. So as we talked about earlier, um, Xilinx isn't gonna do this for us. Uh, it doesn't really know what a wave pipeline is. It's not gonna try and equalize or delay pass. Uh, so we need to place it manually, but I don't wanna do this by hand in the device view because that's gonna take me a long time. Uh, so. I found these lovely things called RPM constraints, which basically you can just group elements together and then using an R-lock origin constraint, place it somewhere on a Cartesian plane inside the FPGA. And that's sort of embedded in your Verilog. This is what that looks like. So for like the X propagation LUT, I can say, hey, I want you in zero, zero, and I also want the sum in zero, zero, and then when I go instantiate this module, I can give it an origin. Um, and then you can see them all packed into a slice. Cool, so the longer you stare at this, the more irregularities you notice in like how this thing's connected together. Uh, it would be a massive pain to do this with a Verilog generate block. Uh, so I use Spinal HDL, because why not? I can black box Verilog modules, uh, and I can also add my R-lock origin constraint uh, and generate this structure in a nice high level-ish HDL. 
So we need to consider the orientation we're going to place the multiplier in the fabric. And the reason for this is Xilinx, um, generally, and especially on the 7 series, they use a column-based architecture. They design a tile, and then they make the whole column the same tile type. Uh, and what this means is that the routing north to south is very regular and predictable, and the routing east to west is irregular. Like maybe you have to go around a DSP column or a BRAM column, something like that. Uh, and with our circuit, we're propagating um, the X and Y terms uh, vertically like this, and if we have any extra delay on that, it's gonna add skew, but we can take delay irregularities on the other axis. So basically, the nets running south to north need to, inst need to propagate instantly, and we can have irregular delays between different layers of this multiplier, and that's totally okay. So this is it placed in the fabric with the RPM constraints. I've got my launch flip-flops on the left. The capture flip-flops are kind of hidden by the view, but they're sitting in the last um, layer of slices right on the output. Um, I have some edge delays up top, which are the... Um, little, the part at the top where it's skipping layers, I need to delay those as well. Uh, and then the yellow region is just buffers because I need to buffer out the first partial products computed instantly in that first cell, and then I need to delay it to stay in phase with the rest of the multiplier. And the green is, of course, the cells themselves. So my results is the max path was 15.5 nanoseconds, the minimum 12.7, and that's a bus skew of around 2.7. Uh, and I was able to find a stable region around 130 megahertz where I was able to get good data and run things through my multiplier, which makes this a two-stage wave pipeline. Um, so somewhat predictably, the logic delay is obviously balanced because I was very careful to make sure that the same amount of LUTs were used on every path, but the FPGA tax, of course, is having interconnects and those add delay. Um, so my net delay is what's causing the skew here. And I didn't do any manual routing. What I did is I used RPM constraints to place everything, and then I said Vivado go. Uh, so the skew, as again, we wanted these signals to propagate instantly. You can see it hits the first interconnect, goes to where I need it to, but then it goes up and hits another one, another one incurring skew each time we do that. Um, so no surprise, that's where it's coming from. Uh, the critical path also isn't surprising because it has this huge south to north run where it goes through all the interconnects and then down the length of the multiplier. So optimizations. Uh, as we just saw, running north to south or south to north, um, we went through those interconnects which added delay which introduced skew. Uh, how do you move south to north in a Xilinx FPGA really quickly? Carry chains, of course. So as a future optimization, what I'm gonna do is manually instantiate the carry chain to propagate this vertical signal up the FPGA on the previous layer and then out the interconnect and over to the next layer. That way I take less skew than going through those big switching blocks in the fabric. Uh, and again, this is uh, like, it's important to consider the orientation because if I were to flip this and build it the other way, the carry chains don't go north to south, they only go south to north. Uh, so some future ideas. Uh, building wave pipelines is a ton of fun, and I've learned a lot doing it. Uh, but I'm also very interested in PNR algorithms and EDA tooling, and I found this cool tool called RapidWrite that essentially lets you build different uh, stages into Vivado. It's like a Java tool thing. Uh, so I think it'd be really cool to try and automate some of this and not do it all by hand. Um, and then I also want to try implementing a skewed wave pipeline implementation. So instead of uh, having a self-synchronous one, I can um, skew the clock and see if I can achieve better results. Uh, so pros. Uh, theoretically, you can get very high throughput because you're pipelining, just as you would increase throughput normally. Uh, but you can also have low latency, as if it was a single stage, because there's no registers and there's no overhead from clocking the clock to queue time and the setup time constraint. Um, cons, there's a lot of them. Uh, it's less resistant to PVT variations for obvious reasons. Um, you could argue that P is the same because you're always doing it on the same FPGA and you can tune it to that, but certainly V and T aren't. Um, it's a lot higher design time. It wouldn't have taken me nearly this long to drop down a DSP block and do the multiply. 
uh, but that would have been less fun. Um, it's not portable at F between FPGAs at all, um, not even between FPGAs in the same series. Um, and in most cases, you're going to burn more power in area because you're adding all these buffers that are going to be switching when you could have just used flip-flops. Uh, and of course, it's an FPGA, so flip-flops are free and optional at the output of every slice. So use the flip-flops. Um, so I have a repo with the wave pipeline uh, in it that you can go and check out and play with. Um, I've got it set up with EDA lies to just build. Um, and I also have the links to some of the papers that are, were really helpful for me learning how this worked um, in the readme of that uh, repository. So questions? Okay, you might have to bear with me on this one. Oh, I got lost a little bit at the beginning. How is this different to a multi-cycle path? So a multi-cycle path would be registered. Uh, at the end, yeah. But imagine you've got, so as you say, you've got something you could pipeline, mm -hmm. or you could just take the flops out and multi-cycle all the way to the destination. Now, what is this different? Does, what is this doing that's different to that? What am I missing? I think, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're talking about is still very much a paradigm where you launch data into your combinational logic block, wait for it to settle, and then the clock edge arrives and captures it. So there's only one data thing propagating through your logic, and then it settles, and then you clock it in. This has multiple waves or stages traveling through the circuit. So it's like a multi-cycle, but you launch multiple times and capture multiple times. Yeah. And you're using the delay propagation to yeah. store the inputs yeah. as it travels through. Yeah. So why couldn't you just constrain this with a multi-cycle path STA constraint? So I did try that, like yeah. constraining the bus skew and Vivado just locked up. And why I think that is is because that's meant for like you know like registers to I/O pins, and it's not really made for considering all these different paths through it. Is what I assumed was going on there. Do internal reg to reg multi-cycles. Couldn't you use that to make this work? So you tell it, oh, I'll be good. I'm only going to launch this once and capture it once. But you could really just launch every cycle and capture every cycle as well. And maybe, and then that'll use STA tool to close all your PVT stuff for you. Maybe. Did you do that? I don't know. Just Any some... thoughts? <laughs> um, have you looked at, a long while ago, there was this arm amulet thing, uh, which was very similar. This was, well, it was, it was self-clocked, I think. Um, and I was wondering if you looked at any of the papers, like I haven't either, other yeah. than that I know the name, um, but they, the whole point was that it would self-clock and so you could turn it down almost to sub-threshold voltages and it would just happily keep ticking along at one kilohertz or whatever uh, until you turn the voltage back up. And so I'm curious if you looked at any of that stuff, read any of those papers. I have not seen these papers, that sounds very cool. Yeah, that's handshaking, oh. clockless, synchronous stuff. Or no, that's an, that's not right. But anyway, yeah, sorry. I think the other con maybe, but maybe yeah. applicable to that area is, if you had a multiplexer, so you had different paths coming in, with a path going out, then the delays will depend on which things you shows on the multiplexer. Right. So it's not a in, in the circuit you show it. It's kind of completely deterministic. I mean, modular delays, of course, but yeah. it's, you don't have alternate data-dependent paths. Yeah, so when I say pipeline, point. I'm very much talking like in a DSP context, not necessarily like processors. Uh, I think the previous presenter actually had some crazy way pipeline thing uh, about building a whole RISC-V CPU that I just looked at the GitHub for that seems pretty cool. Uh, maybe check that out. Have you looked at doing this in the open source FPGA tool chains at all? Uh, I haven't yet, but I have considered trying to do this in ICE 40 and perhaps learning some like Next PNR, studying their code base, just because it's cooler than the Rapid Write tool. Um, so yeah, I'd definitely be interested in considering that, but I haven't yet. Okay, thanks, Rice. Cheers.